This week on the Computer Chronicles, PC troubleshooting. Got problems with your computer? We'll show you how to fix them. Meet Dan Gookin, author of PCs for Dummies. He'll show us the simple stuff. Having Windows 95 nightmares meet First Aid 95. It can cure your Windows problems. And if you're a Mac user, we'll show you the newest Norton utilities for the Power Mac. Plus, the do's and don'ts of memory upgrades, a look behind the scenes at telephone tech support. We'll meet a computer doctor who makes house calls. All this plus where to find help online. This week's Computer News, my pick of the week, coming up next on the Computer Chronicles. The Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by Acer America, proud supporters of intelligent programming, computer or otherwise. Additional funding from the Software Publishers Association, providers of educational materials to help manage software. Don't copy that plotting. Hi, and welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffe. When Dan Gookin got the idea to write a book called DOS for Dummies, it somehow rang true. We all felt a little bit dumb battling the mysteries of DOS. Now Dan is back with a new book on Windows 95, and Dan is here to help us solve some typical PC problems. Welcome, Dan. Sure. I guess this is the new book, Real Life Windows 95. Yep. For all of us who are trying to figure that one out. In real life. In real life. All right, let's talk about some basic, simple problems right. that a typical PC user has. The first one is, you turn the computer on, it doesn't boot, nothing happens. What do I do? Well, there's a lot of different things that can always happen, as it is with a computer. Stupid as it sounds, check to see if it's plugged in. Okay. I mean, look, we have here a seemingly dead computer. We could be pounding on the keyboard. What's going on? Well, let's check maybe the monitor's not turned on, so you punch on the monitor button and you hear a buzz and pretty soon the monitor comes up. Check all your plugs, check everything, make sure that it's working. This is at the dummies level. Well, this is at any <laughs> level. I mean, anyone, everyone's done this. Um, and also another thing is your screen saver. Occasionally a screen may blank. Um, in that case, you know, press a few keys, move the mouse around, Yeah, there it comes. All right, speaking of the mouse, sometimes all of a sudden my mouse is frozen. I move the mouse, cursor won't move. What do I do? This could be a, a number of things. Usually when the mouse is frozen, it probably means the computer has died. And the first thing you should probably try is to press Control-Alt-Delete, which is the safe way to reset your computer. When you do a Control-Alt-Delete in Windows, it'll come up with a little um, mm -hmm. uh, window there that'll tell you if something's not responding, you'll see a message, in, in, uh, or it'll say in uh, Windows 3.1, the system is dead, press Control-Alt-Delete again, or press yeah. Enter or Escape. It generally will tell you what to do. But at that point, pretty much when the mouse cursor's dead, it's you, a mini you got a problem. Reset, yeah. yeah, you got to reset. Okay. Uh, me or somebody else accidentally deletes a file and I say, whoops, I didn't mean to do that, can I recover? Well, there's a, the safest way to recover is with Windows uh, 95, if I can just demonstrate right here. Mm -hmm. When you delete a file in Windows 95, you drag it over to the uh, trash can, which is not the trash can, it's a recycle bin, I'm right. sorry, so Bill. it really doesn't It doesn't delete it, it. Yeah. it puts it in there, so if you want it back, you open up the recycle bin, there it is, you click on it, you choose File, Restore from the menu, and it puts it right back. One of the most co common problems I hear, when I got my computer, it was so fast, I clicked on something, it happened, and for some reason, it takes forever to load a file now. Because when you first got your computer, it didn't have any programs on it. <laughs> <laughs> you start adding these programs, you start creating data. The disk drive is going to get full. There's a few tricks you can do. One is to defragment the hard drive. Now, that would take too long to show here, but it can be done on Windows. All versions, it can be done on DOS. Um, you defragment your hard drive, it's going to clean up a lot of stuff. It's not going to remove programs from your hard drive, it's just going to rearrange them in a faster order. You can also buy more memory, a faster hard drive, or a new computer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. A uh, common one, I put my floppy disk in and I can't get it back out. What do I do? Well, generally, that's pretty confusing. If you put it in and you can't get it out, you probably didn't put it into a disk drive slot. You probably put it into another <laughs> slot somewhere on the computer, and you should, you should try to either yank it out, or if you can't yank it out, you, sometimes you have to take out the, uh, the whole computer. You have to take the whole thing apart to stick it out. That happens a lot. If that does happen, take a little piece of tape and put it over the part where you put in, you know, accidentally put the disc in. Uh -huh. Put the tape over that. If you, so uh, you don't do it again. And, yeah, and you can't put those discs in the wrong way. They will not go okay. in. So if you've stuffed it in there some way, you're going to need professional help to get it out. I <laughs> spilled my coffee on my keyboard. Am I dead? No, you're not dead. Uh, first thing you should do when you do that, my advice is just to turn off the computer. 
whack off the off switch, which I don't recommend doing otherwise, but you don't want to unplug the keyboard when the computer is still on. So you turn off the computer, unplug the keyboard, let the, let the keyboard sit a while. Now there's some people who say you can give your keyboard a bath, literally. You can take it into a tub of hot or lukewarm really? water with soap and let it sit in there, then drain it, and it'll be fine. There's also a professional cleaning stuff you can get for the keyboard. You can take it to Computer Dot. Finally, if I have a laptop, is there any hope in really getting inside there and trying to fix it? Special tool for laptops. <laughs> Kill it! Actually, uh, uh, <laughs> speaking, speaking honestly, laptops generally, when something goes wrong at them, they're so minute and so well put together, just buy a new laptop. Dan, thank you very much. Thanks. All right, usually when you have computer troubles, you call tech support, or at least you tried to. What is really going on on the other side of the phone while you are sitting on hold? We'll show you right now as we pay a visit to the Tech Support Service Department at Claris. Claris Technical Support, this is Ben Miller. Can I help you? At the Claris Corporation in Silicon Valley, the technical yes, support staff receive close to 3,000 calls for help every day by telephone, email, and fax. Welcome to the Claris Support Fax Answer Line. If you know the number of the document you want, please enter that number now. Some of the callers face compatibility problems either in hardware or software. But most calls come from people who aren't sure how to use some part of the program, right. and Claris has refined its help services to reflect that. The technology for self-help, going into a help system in the product or going onto an online service and using the same tools we do within our own support organization, like the databases we use are the same ones on the online services that we would use when we're answering the phone and you can access that 24 hours a day any, any time you want to. So you've kind of got an expert at your fingertips. Subscribers to the company's extended support services receive a membership card, a CD-ROM with the same database as used by the support staff, and a quarterly newsletter. All right, so if the last closure you made was a hard close, the next time it closes automatically, it's gonna be a hard close. If the last closure While 60% of Claris customers use the telephone helpline, Many rely on the company's message board, email, and fax back system. Claris programs contain a resource directory to point users to the kinds of assistance available. But the company is quick to point out that it doesn't expect users to tear their hair out looking for answers. It may sound paradoxical, but we have some people call who said, I have been working on this for three days and I can't figure this out. Well, why did you do that? Why don't you just call us and we'll say, well, oh, it's in the box, here you go. And we, don't frustrate yourself. Look there, if you see it, use it. If you don't, call us, and we'll either point you to it or help you with it, or help you figure out how to do it. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Giles Bateman. If you don't have the patience to deal with tech support, there is another option. Lots of computer problems can be solved with diagnostic utilities. We're going to start out by looking at a program called First Aid 95 from Cyber Media. All right, Sri, let me ask you about this program. This is not something you actually put in after you have a problem, but it's software you put in before you have a problem, right? That's correct. It's, it's sort of like a doctor on call sitting in the background of your computer. So if you have an error message, for instance, like All right, so, so right now we're running Excel. We have. And, mm -hmm. okay, I've already preloaded First mm -hmm. Day 95. It's sitting out there looking for problems. Mm -hmm. And I get this error message. So how do I solve this? If I didn't have this running, I wouldn't, I have to go look it up or call tech support, right? That's right. All right, what do I do with First Day 95? What you do is you bring up First Aid, and it diagnoses the problem. It then says exactly what's wrong and offers to fix the problem. All right, so let's see. So there's the diagnosis. It says, here is the problem description. Right. It says that it's not able to locate some files that are required by the spell checker. Okay, and then it says, here is the solution for those problems. Mm -hmm. All right, so at the bottom, I see I've got choices. I can say, I don't really care about this problem. It's not critical. Just yes. ignore it when you mm -hmm. see it. Mm -hmm. uh, what does generate report do for me? It prints out a report that you can save for later use, or you can send this to someone else. So if somebody else has the same problem, I can say, here's what you do, because this mm -hmm. is what first they told me to do. That's right. All right, and then what's the difference in autofix and manual fix? The autofix just goes off, tries to find the files on your hard disk, and fixes the problem. It's as so easy you don't as have that. to know what's going on. That's just right. say fix it for That's me. That's right. But if you want to get inside, if you want to get inside and control the process, the manual fix will let you do it step by step. All right, so show me what happens if we just click on autofix. It searches for the missing file and updates the configuration, and once it's fixed, it, it turns the 
um, it updates it and that's it. It's pretty much fixed. Uh -huh. So I don't really have to know a lot except click on auto fix most, right. most of the time. Mm -hmm. All right, this is a little bit different from some utilities programs which really do just diagnose, they don't really fix. Yes. But you're saying this diagnoses and, and fixes the thing. Yes, it differs from a lot of other products that you might have heard of also, like Norton mm -hmm. Utilities and other fixed products in the sense that it focuses on software problems, it doesn't fix hardware or disk related problems. And we are finding that software problems are the most common cause of problems on people's computers today. Yeah, certainly if you're using Windows. That's right. Okay, now another thing that's interesting about this is sometimes it will anticipate a crash before it occurs mm -hmm. and kind of avoid you from ever seeing the crash message in a way, right? Yes. Show, show me yes. how that works. Well, suppose I'm, I have disabled first aid at this moment, so this is what you would normally see when you had a crash. All right, right. And, you're and I have a very bad choice usually, <laughs> close or ignore, neither of which does much for me. That's right. You're going to lose your work at this yeah. point. But with first aid being active, if I, when the, before the crash happens, it actually intercepts it and prevents the crash and lets you return back to the application. So I would get your first aid message saying it's about to crash, do this, and then we'll solve the problem? Yes, it actually intercepts it and says, click on auto fix. I'm going to take you back to the point in your application before uh -huh. the crash so you can save your work. Sounds pretty valuable. Okay, so this will work with Windows 95 or with Windows 3.1? Yes, it works with both Windows 95 or Windows 3.1. And how much does it cost me to buy this? It costs about 50 bucks in the store. Okay, 50 bucks or less, something like that. Mm -hmm. All right, first day 95, thanks very much. Thank you. Okay, well, it is sad to say, but true, Macintosh users have computer problems too. And if you have a new Mac, you probably should become acquainted with the new Norton Utilities for the Power Mac. That's this guy right over here. And Joel, you're going to tell us a little bit about this. Uh, what's the typical problem that a Mac user does have? Well, um, typical problems for Mac users would be init conflicts, um, adding new software, something doesn't work right. Mm -hmm. um, possibly they run into problems if they hook up new hardware, things don't work right, such like that. Um, All right, now we're looking at the, the most typical problem I have is you try to right. turn the thing on and you get that horrible question mark instead of the smiley face. Once in a while you run into a problem like this where the machine just won't start, it's giving you a question mark. If you have Norton Utilities handy, what you'll do is boot from our emergency disk and uh, we'll just fire it up on a hard disk here. All right, so one thing I get here is an emergency boot disk. If all else right. dies, I know I can stick your disk in and start. Right. Let's start this up. Mm -hmm. By the way, I should say that if you've got a machine like the 7500 that's got a CD-ROM uh, player built in, go ahead and start up from the system CD so that you bought. start from the CD right. that came with it. Then insert the emergency disk and you'll be okay. Okay, so we overcame that disk crash by, right. by just rebooting again. Now what we're doing here is loading up a separate disk, uh, like the emergency disk that's got Norton Utilities on it, and then we'll launch the Norton Disk Doctor and have it take a look at the disk that wouldn't start. Okay, so presumably the reason the, the machine wouldn't boot up is because I have a hard disk problem and it couldn't find the file it needed to boot There's up? There's some kind of directory problem and Disk Doctor will find out for okay, us. Okay, so how do so we run Disk Doctor So we've selected the disk that is giving us trouble and we click Examine. And it starts off uh, through a series of tests. The bad media check it takes a little while. This checks for... Um, uh, bad sectors on the disk, sectors mm -hmm. that won't hold the uh, magnetic charge to store information. We'll skip that one, go through the directory information. That looked okay. It's checking the system folder now and analyzing the files on the disk, and we'll see what pops up here. All right, so it's just literally checking every folder, right. every file on there to see what's happening. And, and at least you can watch this cute little animation of it. Is right. that Peter Norton sort of pressing buttons for That's me there? That's the disk doctor. <laughs> the disk doctor, okay. So, so you, we're doing two things here. Number one, we're solving the initial problem, but I don't want it to happen a second time, so we're trying to fix the thing that caused the problem. There's in the still first a place. problem on this disk, and in fact, uh, right, the disk so doctor is us? located. It's an error in the boot blocks. Uh -huh. um, it, it does give a detailed message that says, because of this error, you won't be able to start, which confirms what we see. Mm -hmm. We click fix. It's very quick to fix. And on this disk, that's about it. It's uh, perfectly happy to All fix done. multiple problems. Yeah. Um, it will generate a report if you'd like to look to see what it did, what was wrong. Um, that's Disk Doctor. Okay, now is there anything I can do to prevent those kinds of problems? I mean, what would have caused that to happen? I mean, other than dropping the machine or something? Well, a few things. If, you, if indeed you hook up hardware without turning off the machine, absolutely critical. No, if no. you're putting yeah. on a new hard disk, please turn off the machine first. Um, 
other preventative measures that I like to emphasize are please make a backup regularly. Right. In fact, if I could get everyone to make a backup once a week. <laughs> You'd be out of business. <laughs> that would be great. That would be great. Run Disk Doctor on your disk before you make a backup to make sure you're yeah. backing up intact data, but uh, that would Tur Turning a, a Mac off at the wrong time could cause you problems. Like That'll this. cause you problems. Um, follow the instructions with the Mac. That, that's right. a pretty basic uh, piece of business. All else fails, turn to Norton Utilities. Norton Utilities. Okay, thanks, Joel. All right, well, suppose you've called tech support, you've run your diagnostics, and still nothing. Well, time to call the real doctor. Believe it or not, we have found a computer doctor who makes house calls. Vic Chiswick is a troubleshooter. Like a doctor or a firefighter, he is on alert, ready to leap into action when he hears the distress call. While he may not find a fire to extinguish, Vic has every reason to prepare himself for a calamity. He specializes in computer troubleshooting. And the idea for a personal PC problem solver came from his own frustrations. For example, when I bought a computer and I was looking for some help, I just couldn't find any. So uh, I thought there was a big need there. So I went, again, went back to school, learned more about computers, uh, took special classes. And uh, uh, from there on, I just uh, found that uh, there was a market. Vic lends assistance to a cross-section of computer owners, from corporations and home offices to families. He has expertise in everything from network printers to the internet. While computer users can always turn to manuals and technical support lines, sometimes there is nothing to match the personal touch. It expedites everything and gets it solved. Um, which is great. I mean, you know, with, with, with the children running around and, and everything else in, in your life, it's great to have someone come over and this is how you do it. And then also to learn from it so that we don't have to keep, you know, calling someone like a Vic. Um, he explains it fully. And, um, and then we're able to hopefully take what he gave us. And then um, a similar problem comes up, we know the answer. Vic sees his role as a kind of go-between, an interpreter between computer user and manufacturer. Often people don't know what to ask. If they have a problem, they really don't know how to approach uh, the, the repair person for a particular company. For example, if it's Toshiba or somewhere, they may call and, and, and not know what to ask. And the person on the other side doesn't know what they need, so their problems are not solved. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Giles Bateman. Well, so far we've kept the computer closed, no major surgery, but sometimes it takes yanking out the tools, opening up the box to fix something inside your PC. At that point, you really have to know what you're doing. Dan Milkier knows what he's doing. You do this for a living, Dan. Let's talk about some of the basic problems. The computer doesn't start up. It's not my disk drive. Uh, it's not a software problem. What should I be looking for in the box? Inside the box, you should, the first thing to look for is the, listen for the power supply, make sure the fan is running. That way you know you have power to your system. Okay, so first thing is do we have power? Correct. Not only is it plugged in, but is the power supply working? Exactly. How do, okay, suppose I hear the fan, uh, do I, should I, can I still test and make sure that the right voltage is coming out of that? Oh, absolutely. Um, you can go and pick up a basic voltmeter like this uh -huh. and then test it. Maybe we should turn it off before Yeah, yeah let's turn anything. it off before we touch anything. <laughs> first thing is when you shut it down, Bef you can open it. It's okay to. It's always okay to open the case uh -huh. before you start. But before you stick your, your fingers in, in shut it. Up. All right. Now, where case. would I go test the test the voltage on the power supply? Well, any of the cables that come from the power supply, you can test them for. Just pull it out. It'll have the two black wires in the middle, and there'll always be a diagram uh -huh. along with a power supply. You should be able to find. But the this. black ones are always the ground. Right. You have the, yellow the two one. blacks. Yeah. The yellow is your 12 volts. I'm looking for 12 DC, volts out of that one. Five volts out DC, of the red one. Out of the red. Also, where the motherboard, well, excuse me, where the power supply plugs into the motherboard, right. you'll have also what's called a power good signal, which you can also test for proper voltage. Okay, now the point here is my problem might just be power supply. That's right. 30 bucks or something, and I've, it's exactly. not a ma major big deal, no. and I can fix the computer. It's a very easy part to replace. It'd take you a 
just okay. very little time. Other things aren't working, I should look for loose stuff, right? Correct, correct. Like what? Always one of the major problems with computers is just a loose cable. All right, let me, let me bring this up so we can get a good shot okay. of that. So for instance, that the, the drive controller cable may not be plugged in, huh? Correct. And that would be that, that big gray thing there. Right, and the, the trick is not just to look and see if, it, well, it looks plugged in from here, but it may not be. You want to get your fingers in there and, and make sure push it's really it down. In real tight. Make sure it's in there real tight. Yeah. It's snug. All right, what about loose boards? If I move the computer around, can a, can a board pop out? Exactly. The same thing you'll see a lot of times, especially with the longer types of controller cards. So um, that board is not really seated properly. Correct. Correct. But from the top, got, it sort of might look okay. Right, right. So you, you really got to sort of snap that guy in there and seat it exactly. properly. Exactly, and make sure that it's screwed in properly, tightened down. And that's that, that would solve about 9 out of 10 problems with most computers. All right, now let me ask you next. <laughs> I went out and bought memory. I paid all that money. I thought I plugged them in right, and I turned on my computer, and I don't see the memory. What, what's, the pro what's the problem there? Again, let me show on this motherboard. Uh -huh. It could be very simple as did you get the right type of memory. Yeah. That's <laughs> believe it. That's one of the problems a lot so of people maybe have. Maybe I bought the wrong thing. Correct. Maybe also, I didn't plug it in right. Right. Not only that, but also is sometimes the slot you put it into. For example, when you're dealing with a 72 pin, yeah, which is it's just turned around backwards, so you can't really mm -hmm. see. But sometimes it'll have a bank zero, bank one. You got to put them in the right direction. Correct. And also make sure you look at your motherboard manual. There may there may be jumpers that you need to set. So you got to set the jumpers. Correct. All right. Final point: when you open up your box. What should you not do? What do you have to be careful of so you don't blow yourself up and you don't blow right, the machine right. up? A couple, again, the, the most important thing is ground yourself first. Mm -hmm. touch, touch some metal here. And if you're going to get in there with a screwdriver and a pair of pliers. Make sure the thing's turned just, off. Just before, yeah, turn it off. And then before and when you, you drop turn one on of those case, little screws in there. You go get it. Before okay. you turn it on, you, you, can, all, you can short out exactly. the Exactly. It, it'll probably be sitting right against your most expensive chip. Dan, thanks a lot. All right, sometimes the best source of help for solving a computer problem is going online. Odds are somebody else has had the same problem you have, and there's probably a message posted somewhere that will solve your problem. Giles has some advice on how to find help online. Thanks, Stuart. If you're having trouble with a specific piece of software or hardware, one of the best ways to go about finding information about troubleshooting it is to go straight to the source. On a lot of the online services, I happen to be on America Online right now, uh, vendors maintain forums where you can get information about their products, and in many cases, they'll have already experienced the problem you're talking about, and they'll tell you how to solve it right there online. Now, if you want to go out on the web, you can find those companies there as well. But in many cases, uh, th these are problems you're going to have to look to other users to help find answers for. Uh, in this case, I've gone to a good page here called Doc's Tech Notes. And uh, Doc here has sort of maintained a list of all sorts of uh, links to sources of information about troubleshooting Windows and Windows 95. And he's also got nice little descriptive sentences about each of the pages as well. Now, if you're a Mac user, you'll want to go to the Complete Conflict Compendium. This has uh, just started recently, but they're quickly building a database of all the different types of conflicts that can happen between different programs and how to solve them. Now, last but not least, your computer may be working fine, but you're having trouble with the Internet, whether it's understanding an idea or it's a specific uh, problem with a piece of client software. Well, come to the Internet Help Desk, and then uh, you'll you see there are different areas, email connectivity, Internet network connectivity, I'll go to that and you will find answers, probable causes for your problems, and ways to solve it. If you've got a question about the Internet, this is the place to start looking. Now, time for our weekly summary of what's new in the field of personal computing. Here's this week's Random Access. In the Random Access file this week, another security flaw found in Netscape's Navigator web browser. A Princeton University team says the flaw could allow programmers to create websites that would be able to destroy or steal data from visiting users. Netscape is working to eliminate the problem. And there's another new search engine online. Wired Magazine and Inktumi have joined together to introduce Hotbot. The search service claims to search every last one of the 50 million web pages in existence. Unlike other indexes, which use a single large computer, Inktumi technology uses several smaller machines networked together. At the Spring Consumer Electronics Show, TV manufacturer Curtis Mathis demonstrated its new Uniview technology to provide internet access through your TV set. You will also be able to send faxes and swipe your credit card through the unit for home shopping. At the Electronic Entertainment Expo, Sega introduced an internet peripheral to connect to its Saturn game machine. Called NetLink, the device will cost about $200. We're, we're going to be bringing a lot of product onto the uh, NetLink where you can play against one another. But really, we're all just uh, amateurs at the kind of gameplay we can do on the Internet.
Bandai Digital has announced plans to release its low-cost multimedia and Internet information appliance in September. Based on Apple Pippin technology, the unit will be called At World and sell for about $600. And Cyber Media is taking your computer on the net to upgrade your software. The new service is called Oil Change. That's it for this week's news. Back to you, Stuart. Now for my pick of the week. PDAs have gotten a kind of bad name after the high promises made for the Apple Newton and then its disappointing performance. The problem with the original Newton was high cost, small memory, and funny handwriting recognition. Casio tried the PDA game with the Zoomer, but that was a flop. Sony has its Magic Link, which is a nice piece of technology, but it's big and bulky and used to cost a lot. My favorite handheld device has been the Sharp Wizard. Well put together, functional, and a real business tool. But I think perhaps the best version of a PDA has just come out from Hewlett Packard called the OmniGo 100 Personal Organizer Plus. This little thing is an almost perfect combination of the Newton and the Wizard. It's really small, it has a keyboard, but it also has an electronic notepad that uses a handwriting recognition system called Graffiti. Spend about five minutes learning how to use it and you will get very reliable handwriting recognition. The OmniGo comes complete with dozens of practical tools like a stopwatch, an alarm, a world time clock, an HP 12C financial calculator, a real full feature spreadsheet, and all the usual personal organizer tools. Plus, it lets you fold the thing so you can use it this way like a wizard or fold it this way and use it just like a Newton. Best of all, OmniGo is selling for under $350. It is really a cool little gadget. That's it for this week's Computer Chronicles. We'll be back here again next week with another half hour of the latest in personal computer technology. I'm Stuart Chaffe. We'll see you here next time. The Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by...